And John Sawat was fond of saying that all the people in the world have only one person. In other words, each of us has ourself that we're responsible for. No, he didn't mean that in a narrow, selfish way. What he meant was that each of us should realize that we have to be responsible for our actions. Most of us spend our time going around trying to straighten other people out. And as a result, we neglect the one area where we really are responsible. What we do, what we say, what we think. And we should treat each other person as a responsible person. This is why the Buddha said when you're acting for your own benefit, you're observing the precepts, you're generous, and you train the mind. When you're working for the benefit of others, you're getting them to be generous, to observe the precepts, and to train the mind. In other words, you're giving them the dignity of being responsible people, paying attention to the fact that they're not just the recipients of your actions, but they are generators of their own actions. So if you try to get other people to break the precepts, you're really harming them. If you talk them into being ungenerous, you're harming them. So this is why we start with the mind when we meditate, because all our actions come out of the mind. And in meditating, we're setting a good example for others, because the best way to get other people to be generous, virtuous, and, and to meditate is to do it ourselves, so that the actions, our actions go with our words. Our words are backed up by the power of our own experience, and people can see the example. And if they can see the good results, then they're more likely to do it. Which is why meditating is not a selfish activity. Observing the precepts is not a selfish activity. Recently I read someone saying that you know, if you're preserving your precepts, and of course doing that, other people happen to get harmed by other people. In other words, you don't go out and kill the people who are harming others, then you're being selfish. Which is wrong on so many levels, it's hard to count them all. Because if you go out and kill, you're creating an example that other people will take. And you have no idea how many other people may take that example down the line. And you don't really know, say you've killed that other person, how much evil you've prevented. But you do know that you've used your own body to kill. That much you do know, and you've been irresponsible. So there's nothing selfish about observing the precepts. You set a good example, the same that being generous sets a good example. Your Donna talks a lot at retreats. Well, the best way to teach people generosity is to be generous yourself. The best way to bring about peace in the world is to get your own mind peaceful. Because it's right here that you're generating the world in which you're going to live. It has an impact on other people. So you have to be careful about that. But if you're the primary recipient of what you're doing right now. So be very careful about that. Give yourself the dignity of being an agent, and not just a recipient, not just a victim of other people's activities, or a recipient of their virtue. You want to be a generator of virtue. You want to be a generator of generosity, a generator of concentration and wisdom. That's how these things come out into the world. You've got the source right here. And so grant yourself that dignity that you're going to create a good source in every possible opportunity. 
that generosity has its has its limitations. You can have only so much energy, so much material things to give, so much knowledge to give. You'd be very generous, though, universally generous with your virtue. In other words, you make up your mind that under no circumstances are you going to break the precepts. And as the Buddha said, you're granting universal safety in the sense that the world is safe from at least your corner. All the world is safe from your corner, and you've got to share in that universal safety. And again, never underestimate the power of a good example that you create. This is how goodness gets spread around in the world. Not by people talking, not by a book so much as examples. When you read of someone who's done something really unselfish, it's very inspiring. You realize okay, the world is a place with good people. People are able to overcome their their defilements or their narrowness or whatever. They keep them bound. The things that keep them bound up in the cycle of suffering and then revenge for suffering and then more suffering and then more revenge for suffering. That goes nowhere. We've seen way too much of that. But it's the people who stand up and say, no, I'm not going to continue that way. Those are the ones who make the human world a good world to be in, and they inspire us all. So you want your examples, the examples you set, by your thoughts, words, and deeds to be good ones. That's one of the ways in which you are acting for the benefit of others. So always keep that point in mind. The Buddha grants us the dignity of having freedom of choice. Kant, the German philosopher, said this is what makes human beings worthy of respect, is that they do have that freedom. That's one point in which he was right. The thing is that it, we're really worthy of respect when you, we use that freedom well. There was another statement that John so I'd like to make. Is there's a little drawing you see in books in Thailand. It's all over the place. They take the words ya and gat doa, which literally means don't be selfish, and they form them into a picture of a Buddha. The head is ya, the chest and the arms are hen, gat doa, the legs. And he commented several times that that was very mis misguided teaching. The Buddha never said that. He says, look after yourself, which is another way of hand get to it. Look after yourself and do it wisely. As King Basanity said, it's the people who are skillful in their thoughts, words, and deeds. Those are the ones who have themselves protected. In other words, you don't harm anybody. That's your protection. You're generous with others. That's your wealth. So you're looking after yourself in the proper way. And particularly when you meditate, because you realize the mind right here is the source of everything. So you want to get it well trained. All the teachings having to do with meditation are very closely related to the teaching on karma. When the Buddha teaches meditation, when he teaches mindfulness, those three qualities. Mindfulness, alertness, ardency. They all center around on what you're doing. Mindfulness is what reminds you of what needs to be done, what works, what doesn't work. Alertness focuses not just on just anything coming up in the present moment. It focuses on your actions and the results you're getting from your actions. And then ardency is what wants to get good results out of your actions, which means that if you're doing something that's not getting good results, you turn around and you look very carefully at what you're doing to see what you can change. The Four Noble Truths are also teachings on karma. They give you a set of categories to tell you what to do in any given circumstance when you're dealing with suffering. The duty is to comprehend it. 
when you find the cause, the duty is to abandon it. The path is something you develop so that you can realize the cessation of suffering. These are guides to actions. So it's important to remember that when the compilers of the canon in the past made the comment that this is a this is a teaching on karma. They classified the Buddhist teaching as that teaching on karma. And they were right. And it's because it's a teaching on karma that it's also a teaching on your dignity, your responsibility. So learn to look after this one person you've got. And that way, you're providing protection for the entire world. You're providing wealth for the entire world, the wealth of an inspiring example.